we're going to do is we're going to expand upon our idea of market failures of externalities and we're going to be taking a look at a specific field of study known as environmental economics and we'll expand into this and we'll take a look at really how economics has a say and what exactly they look at with environmental economics. So to give some context, right, if you weren't aware, going back a little bit now, so during the summer of 2019, we had the hottest global July on record. Summer of 2020 was very similar. I believe we broke similar kind of records. The ice sheets in Greenland, they're melting at their fastest pace ever. Uh, the Amazon rainforest in 2019. So we had that huge forest fire going on there. We had massive forest fires in California for 2020, but the 2019 Amazon rainforests they had 640 million acres being burned. To put that into perspective, for those of you who live here on Vancouver Island, that's equivalent to about 80 Vancouver Islands on fire. So question is, and this often comes up, is, well, hey, climate change, everything that's going on with that, really does economics have a say in this? I mean, aren't we just a social science? Shouldn't we leave this to the climate scientists and everybody over on that side? Well, yes, to a degree, they have a lot of input, they have a lot of say on this, but ultimately, this problem is economic in nature, right? This problem, this all of this issue arose starting with the Industrial Revolution, so just over 100-ish years ago, and it has accelerated through to today. So that being said, this is an economic problem. The pollution that we are producing is a byproduct, an externality of our economic actions, our economic endeavors. So in that sense there, yes, this is an economic problem. It is an economic problem in nature and thus the suitable solutions, the way we need to solve this problem is economic itself. So not to minimize climate scientists, not to put any kind of playing down of their role, vital hugely vital in how we combat this going forward, but ultimately this boils down to an economic issue. And I get this a lot, that hey, economics is the problem with climate change, we need to change our economics, we need to do this, it is you economists that have created this. And I really, I really fight back on that, because no, what we're doing in economics is we are explaining human behavior. We are explaining how the world around us works, how people make their decisions given scarce resources, and then we look at ways that, hey, you know what, when we don't have an optimal scenario, we can maybe use government policy to push us, to nudge us to a correct situation, ideally, right? So in that sense there, no, it's not the economics discipline that's caused this failure. It's not us as a whole that is causing climate change to happen. It is individuals acting in their own best interest that is the problem. Lack of oversight, lack of regulation, lack of taking a look at these external costs and recognizing that they are a problem. There was, back in 2011, a documentary known as Surviving Progress, where David Suzuki actually makes the comment that economics and the use of environmental economics is a form of brain damage. And his rationale about this is that, well, everything that we've taken a look at in environmental economics is that, hey, all these environmental, social, all these other impacts are just extra costs. And the problem is, is it was kind of this view of, oh, it's just an extra cost. We don't care about that. We don't think about that. But no, that fundamentally misses the point. We do care about these external costs. We do care about these externalities. They are a fundamental focus of the area of study. So what we're going to be going looking at here through the remainder of this video is how exactly we model the impacts of economic behavior on climate change, the costs of transitioning to a low carbon energy source, a low carbon economy, and some of the problems that we may have in this transition process. So without further ado, let's take a look at these policies. Let's take a look at how we can do this. This really all is going to stem from our initial model that we've already taken a look at, which is just taking a look at our externalities. So we'll start off with externalities say, hey, look, we've already looked at this, and then we'll move on to a different model for modeling what we know as pollution abatement. So let's take a look at our externality model to start. So for our externality model, what did we have? We had situation, and let's say we're talking about, right, a pretty bad polluter. Let's say we're talking about the market for coal power as created through coal power plants. 
And in this case here, we have again our marginal social benefit, which is one and the same as the marginal private benefit. And right, if we want to be a little bit clear, this is be coal electricity. So in this case here, yes, our marginal social benefit is one and the same as our marginal private benefit because, well, when I use that electricity, I get the benefit of it. So my benefit, society's benefit, there we have it. At the same time, well, we have our marginal private cost, which is the cost of the coal power plant to produce an extra, say, gigawatt hour of electricity, right? We can say this here, our quantity is in terms of gigawatt hours produced, and we would have our private equilibrium. We would have, there you go, our quantity being produced and the cost of each gigawatt hour. Well, we've seen that, hey, coal power, as well as many of our goods actually have these external costs, such that we have a marginal social cost, which is that marginal private plus the marginal external. Keep in mind again that all of that pollution, all of that problem that goes along with coal energy, all of that is our marginal external cost, that extra cost that we get for every extra gigawatt hour we produce from coal power. And the big thing to keep in mind, right, is that we as a society, we get value, we get benefit from electricity, even if it's coming from coal. In this sense here, even with the cost of burning coal, we still have some quantity social that we would want to be produced, right, or that could ideally be produced. Now, as more and more come online, maybe this cost becomes more and more not able as our demand shifts to alternative sources. But as it is, we do get benefits from electricity, even if they're from dirty sources, such that the current demand is saying, yeah, okay, we'll incorporate this extra cost into our production and we'll still produce some by this dirty electricity, but not nearly as much. And so in this case here, we would have our Q private. Ideally, we want to get down to our Q social. And as a result, our price private would go up to our price social. Okay, problem with this model though, is that we aren't modeling pollution, right? In this model here, what we're looking at is we have this externality, right? And in this case here, this externality, this guy here, this is our essentially our pollution. Every additional gigawatt hour we produce gave us an additional X units of pollution. And okay, problematic with that. We're not really interested in modeling electricity. We want to model pollution itself. And so what you can kind of think of is that really attached to this model is quantity pollution. If every gigawatt hour produces an extra so much dollars worth of pollution, right? And maybe this here is, I don't know, maybe it's something like $10 per ton of greenhouse gas. Well, in this case here, our quantity would be greenhouse gases. And maybe it's something like, at our private optimal, we have something like 100 million tons of greenhouse gas. Question is then, what is the socially optimal level of pollution? Can we point to a socially optimal level of pollution? What ought to be a socially optimal level of pollution? And here, this is where it really gets onto a lot of people's nerves who are environmentalists and don't really fully think through this problem is they clearly say, hey, this is a really trivial question. Socially optimal level of pollution is zero. We should have zero pollution. Okay, great. Maybe that's a nice dream, but given our technology, given what we have available to us, is that really a reality? And beyond that, you got to think, well, why do we even have pollution, right? Does anybody go and say, hey, 
I'm just going to go and buy a bunch of pollution, please. Just load it up. I want a bunch of extra pollution. No, 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 we don't at all, right? Pollution really is just a byproduct, a complement, if you were, of our production process. What are we interested in? Well, we're interested in producing electricity. The problem is when we produce electricity, we get this byproduct of pollution. And that is we want to get to a point such that we've priced that true cost of pollution such that the benefit society gets from electricity is equal to that extra cost that society faces of producing the electricity, including the costs of pollution. That is, we would have a socially optimal level of pollution for most sources of pollution that's non-zero, that is actually positive. And that's because we don't ever produce, we don't ever consume pollution directly. It's a byproduct of our production process. And we get benefit from that production process. And thus, once we incorporate the costs of pollution, well, very rarely are we going to drive our production to zero. Because that's the only way to get zero pollution. Zero pollution would be zero production. And zero production cannot be efficient. We would starve. We would freeze. It would be a very bad day for humanity. So in that argument there, yes, we must have some socially optimal level of pollution. That's not equal to zero. And if we took a look at this, maybe that's something like 60 million tons of greenhouse gas, such that this here, that is going to be the level of pollution that is linked to the socially optimal level of gigawatt hours being produced. Because if we actually take a look at social cost, social benefit, we are including the cost of pollution into our social cost, into our calculus, into our accounting of determining, hey, what is an appropriate price so that we actually account for all of our production costs. Okay, great. So we have this idea of pollution. We have this idea of pollution that really then is just kind of this residual, this add-on to our externality process. And that is, okay, we could take a look at the market for coal electricity, and then we could add on this whole coal, how much tons of greenhouse gases are released for every gigawatt hour produced. The problem is, though, is that we're not modeling pollution directly, right? This is just a residual model. We want to model pollution directly. And the problem with that is that if we take a look at a good, like, electricity, well, electricity is an economic good, right? It is an economic good, so we have a downward sloping demand curve, that is a downward sloping marginal social benefit, marginal private benefit, we have upward sloping cost curves. Well, the issue then is that pollution, pollution is not an economic good, right? Pollution, pollution is an economic bad. So in that case there, if we wanted to model pollution, we wouldn't have these downward sloping marginal social benefit curves, right? We wouldn't get this decreasing benefit as the more and more pollution we have. Do we even get benefit directly from pollution, right? So our modeling process would fall apart if we were to focus on modeling pollution directly in this way. So bit of an issue. We don't want to model pollution strictly as a residual. We want to get a model of pollution itself, but we can't model it this way here. So what we do is we kind of twist it a little bit and we say, okay, well, we can't model, pol model pollution directly. So let's model instead pollution abatement and abatement that's just fancy for reduction right so how do we reduce pollution and now hey pollution reduction pollution abatement all right let's just let's just write that down because abatement is going to be our word that we'll keep using that is fancy for reduction right and now every unit of pollution we reduce every unit of pollution we abate that is a benefit to society, and we would have our downward sloping benefit curves. There is a cost to reducing pollution, and that cost increases the more that we abate. So we would have upward sloping cost curves, 
meaning we would have our traditional kind of diagram. And we could model our whole pollution abatement something like this. We could say, okay, and we'll start off by doing it in terms of quantity abated. We'll start off by doing it in terms of percent. So we'll do something like that. That would be ideally 100% abatement. That is if we could fully reduce all the pollution in the atmosphere, in the oceans, altogether no pollution left at all. Well, to start off, what we would have is we would have our marginal social benefit, right? The benefit, the extra benefit society gets every time we reduce an extra unit of pollution. And we would expect this marginal social benefit curve to look something like this. So initially, we get big extra benefit, right, as we go and we reduce our first unit of pollution we get massive amounts of extra social benefit from that, right? This is marginal social benefit. However, as we continue, continue to continue to increase our abatement, well, we get less and less and less extra social benefit from it. At some point, we're kind of arguing between, hey, do we want Banff quality air or do we want Jasper quality air? They're both pretty darn good. They're the nice, crisp alpine mountain air. One is slightly a bit cleaner than the other, but most people would never notice the difference. They'd both say, wow, these are amazing air qualities. At some point, you really just don't get much extra benefit from society for reducing pollution that extra little bit. So, okay, from that sense there, we would have this marginal social benefit kind of dropping off. And probably dropping off more rapidly than how we have it shown here. At the same time, we would have our marginal social cost, such that our marginal social cost is going to look something like this. Starting off... Oh, I'm using the wrong tool. That's why that's not working. There we go. So marginal social cost starts off, rises, and then likely shoots off to up to near an infinite price as we approach 100% abatement. That is, right, initially, initially it's fairly cheap. Initially we can go, we can clean up our local park, and just that little bit of pollution reduction has a very low cost, very huge benefit attached to it. And so, yeah, that makes sense to do. However, as we continue to abate pollution, that is, as we continue to reduce pollution, more reduction, more reduction, more reduction, we get higher and higher and higher extra cost to reduce that extra unit of pollution. Eventually, we get to near infinite costs as we're looking at how do we remove those last few ppm of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? How do we remove those last few little ppm of mercury or heavy metals from the water? Right, the last few there, well, maybe that's just okay to leave it a little bit polluted. Maybe that cost to society to remove it is nowhere near the benefit that society would receive. In this sense here, by taking a look at pollution abatement, we can model and we can work out what is our socially optimal quantity abated. Such that, hey, if we had 100% pollution, so that would be kind of our default, hey, just Forget about it. Just keep pumping everything into the environment. The environment will deal with it. It's strong. It's resilient. Well, if we abated pollution, that is, if we said, no, 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 we want to reduce, sorry, I guess zero. Zero would be zero abatement. So that would be our current situation. 100 would be no more pollution. We got all of it gone. We reduced it and we extracted all the pollution out of it. Maybe something like this, maybe something like this is a 75% level of abatement. That is, if we want to think about it, this way from 0 to 75, that is my quantity abated. That means, though, that from 100 to 75, well, that there, that is my quantity that I'm still polluting. 
So that's my quantity pollution. And that is my optimal level of pollution that would still exist given the social benefit, the social cost of abatement. Okay, so we could ideally go and take a look at this in this kind of way and we could model, hey, here's our social benefit that we get every time we reduce pollution. Here's how much it's gonna cost us to reduce pollution. We can work out an optimal model, an optimal idea as to how much pollution we should abate. And then similarly, what's that gonna cost per unit? Great. Okay, so in this here, we can estimate this. We estimate that the total cost, right? So the total cost to move to a low carbon environment, the low carbon environment we would need, if we gave us a time limit of transitioning to that, so let's pretend we know what this is, the cost to transition to this kind of best case scenario by 2060, Total cost, so again, keep in mind how we can find that total cost. This is my marginal social cost. So if we aggregate underneath that, aggregate underneath that curve to find my total cost all the way to there, we would expect our total cost to get to that optimal level of abatement to be something like $44 trillion. $44 trillion. And okay, that's a lot, but right, as soon as we start thinking, honestly, as soon as we start thinking of more than a million, people often just go, yeah, okay, it's a big number. I don't really know how big that is. So let's give it some context. Currently, currently the real, the entire value of the entire world economy, everything we produce, Right? And this is, of course, we live in a U.S.-centric world, so that's current U.S. dollars. Actually, that's, I believe, 2018 dollars. Currently, the value of the entire U.S. or not the current U.S. economy, the world economy, everything produced in the world is 80 trillion dollars. And again, measured in U.S. dollars because we live in a U.S.-centric world. So that is really we're looking at over half of the cost of everything we buy and sell globally would be our cost to transition to a low carbon environment. So that's a massive cost. A Little bit of extra perspective, some big costs that we as a society have faced in the past. Uh, let's take a look at World War II. World War II, if we took a look at World War II in modern dollars, so right, scaled it up to say, what would it cost if we had World War II today? That would have been $4 trillion. Similarly put in perspective, if we took a look at the Cold War, so big Cold War race between the US and Russia. Cold War, that was a cost of $8 trillion. So that is truthfully this climate emergency, this whole battle to kind of correct climate change has an unprecedented global cost. Absolutely massive. Does that just mean we throw in the towel and forget about it? Say, eh, that's, that's insane. Sorry, we're done. No, clearly not. There's solutions, they're not easy solutions, but there's definitely solutions there for us. Okay, so we've taken a look at this model of pollution abatement. We've estimated our cost to move to our optimal quantity abatement, or at least to a quantity abated. It turns out that this ability, this ability to estimate this optimal quantity abatement is actually extremely difficult. And it's extremely difficult for a lot of reasons. In order to estimate our optimal quantity abated, well, we'd have to first be able to estimate our marginal social benefit for abating pollution. We would have to estimate our marginal social cost for abating pollution. And we'd have to work through right, our statistical models in, a, in order to go through that. And it turns out that, well, while many, many disciplines are facing the problem of having more and more and almost too much data to be able to work with and they're kind of creating new methods as to how to deal with the massive amounts of data they have available to them environmental science a lot of environmental fields are dealing with the opposite problem a lot of environmental fields are dealing with less and less data and that is as you have less and less data it becomes increasingly difficult to measure the impacts of climate change 
If you have less data, you have less accurate results. Your models become less accurate. You get more and more error in those models. And why is this happening? Well, we had early in the Trump presidency, we had Trump deleting, rather pulling the plug on all of the EPA's data sets on this. So Environmental Protection Agency. Boom, massive amounts, arguably the largest amounts of data collected in the world on environmental changes and all of that, species, wildlife counts, temperature, movement of ice, ice levels, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, etc. Gone. Gone. Right? Luckily, a bunch of uh, individuals went and backed up that data the best that they could, but it's now fragmented across thousands of sources and very difficult to negotiate very difficult to find. So some issues with that. Similar thing happened in Canada a few years prior. Underneath the Harper government, we closed the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Library. Very similar kind of scenario, very similar loss of data. And we're seeing this happening all around the world. We're seeing the data that we can use in order to model, in order to kind of figure out, hey, what is the impacts of pollution? What are the impacts of climate change? This data is becoming increasingly difficult to get. And the rationale behind it, right, as far as it can kind of see, is that you can't prove it's a problem if you don't have the data to prove. So, hey, it's not a problem if you can't prove it's a problem. There you go. We got rid of the data. Climate change isn't a thing. It's just a made-up thing. So problem number one is that we have this idea as to how we can figure out our optimal abatement, how we can model the marginal social cost, the marginal social benefit for reducing pollution, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to do so. Farther, let's ignore that data problem. Let's pretend we have the data. We still have a few other problems with this model. First, first one is that there's no market, right? There would be no natural market to form for pollution. No one is going to say, hey, I'd like to buy a ton of greenhouse gases, please, right? There's, it's not an enjoyable thing. There's not a desire from an individual to abate pollution. So there's no market that would just freely form for this. So that is strictly, we would need government intervention. We would need governments to form this market on our behalf, but that means that we as a people would need to want to vote in a government to act in that way. And that is we would want to vote in a government that was willing to impose higher costs, higher taxes on us to do that. That, right, that becomes difficult. That becomes difficult. We also have technological problems, right? We have technological, we have engineering problems as to whether or not it was even feasible to scale up our current technology, our current capital to such a way that we could abate the level of pollution that we need. Now, mind you, areas of study in this are a huge focus amongst many universities, amongst many firms. There's potentially a lot of money to be had in here. So it's a huge area of technological advancement. We're seeing breakthroughs every year that we never thought were possible. Hopefully this will change. But currently there are huge technological problems in even achieving an optimal level of abatement. That's, that's problematic. Third, third is we have legal, we have legal impediments, right? We have legal problems to this. And this whole legal challenge comes back to, do firms, do firms have the right to pollute or do we have the right to clean air? Just to simplify it, we'll say to clean air. And it seems like, well, that's a rather trivial argument. Clearly, we have the right to clean air, right? But nah, not really. If we look historically, we have allowed firms to pollute freely. And so we kind of have a bit of a legal precedent to say that firms have the right to pollute. That is, if we want firms to reduce their pollution, it's really legally not fair for us to tax them. They've always done it. It's us that now has the problem. That is... Because we have the problem, it's not fair to make them pay for the pollution. It's more, hey, we need to subsidize them. We need to give them money not to pollute. And you can see very quickly how that becomes unpopular with the masses, right? Is what? We need to give firms money so that they don't pollute? That, that doesn't seem right, right? And thus the legal issues. 
Finally, our fourth problem is even if we could overcome all of this, even if we could create a market, even if we had the technology, even if we could overcome the legal battles, even if we had all the information to figure out what our optimal quantity abatement should be, we still have political challenges, right? And these political challenges, we see these all around us in the world today. We have many political parties, we have many political groups that just refuse to acknowledge that this is a problem, refuse to acknowledge that we need to have change. Keep in mind, this whole alarm started ringing in the late 80s, right? That was the first time that we kind of came forward and said, hey, we have an issue with this. We need to start addressing climate change. That is, we've had 40 years of talking about this in a political realm, 40 years of inaction. To imagine that this will all of a sudden change today, ah, it's tough, right? And again, the problem with this is that our individual our individual, we want to do individually as a rational outcome is in contrast to what is socially optimal. Our individual optimal is to let the world burn around us. But clearly, socially, that is not ideal. So we need to kind of get over that. We need to say, yes, we recognize that that's going to mean higher taxes. It's going to mean that we're going to have to actually pay for the pollution that we just throw out, right? It's not just, well, we got to pollute for free in the past. Why do we just continue doing it? This whole idea of a carbon tax, that's not really us paying for pollution. That's just a government tax grant. No, it's not, right? We need to start paying for these resources. And in doing so, yes, we will face higher prices, but it is part of the solution, part of the step forward. So, okay, we have these problems. We have all of that going on. Let's go and let's take a look at if we could overcome all of these Let's take a look at some pollution abatement schemes that work that we currently have in play, some ways in which governments can intervene, put in price controls, put in different methods to influence this market, and for us to arrive at an efficient level of abatement. And that's really what we want, right? We saw $44 trillion to select it to correct this problem. That's a massive amount of money. It doesn't make any sense to try to fix this problem inefficiently. It's going to cost enough as it is. We might as well do it in the most efficient, the cheapest way we can. And let's take a look at how we can do that. What we're going to take a look at is pollution abatement schemes. That is pollution abatement, abatement policies of ways in which government can go about enacting ways to reduce pollution. That is, in order to get to an optimal level of pollution abatement, assuming we could determine where that optimal level of pollution abatement even is. Then we're going to take a look at three different schemes. First one, I'm just going to call a command scheme. And underneath a command scheme, this is where the government just says, hey, this is your target. Say we need to have a pollution abatement. We need to abate 100 units of pollution. We have 10 firms. So, hey, all of you firms, you must abate 10 units each. In that case there, it's fair, it's even across everybody, boom, there we go. We'll see that this command scheme, this is typically inefficient. It's typically going to be the most costly way to engage in pollution abatement. The problem is, it's the most costly, it's inefficient, it doesn't really work, but yet it seems to be the scheme that is the most favored amongst many people pushing for climate action. And that's a problem, right? That's a problem. That is going to explode that cost of dealing with the problem way above that $44 trillion, making this significantly more expensive to work out. We don't want that as a society. It's going to be a big enough problem as it is. So what are some of our other ones? We'll also take a look at the carbon tax. We'll take a look at the carbon tax, and we'll see that this here is actually an efficient solution. That is, it is the least cost way in order to deal with this. We'll also take a look at what is known as the cap, cap and trade model. And we'll see that again, this here is an efficient way to deal with it. In fact, carbon tax, cap and trade, those are just two different flip sides of the same coin, two different ways to deal with the problem to get the same result. And so we'll talk about each of them and kind of compare and contrast them as well. Okay. So first what we need to do before we really talk about these, we need to talk about another type of efficiency. 
And the type of efficiency that we need to talk about here, we've already taken a look at allocative efficiency, which is, hey, are we allocating our resources in the most efficient way possible? In this case, we need to talk about instead of allocative efficiency, we need to look at what is known as productive. Productive efficiency. And productive efficiency, very simply, right, for 103, the way that we can define this is that productive efficiency occurs when the marginal costs are equated across all firms. That is, that extra cost to produce an extra unit is one and the same in every single firm in the industry. If that's the case, then this good is being produced in the absolute least cost method. That is, you couldn't reallocate who's producing what, who's abating what, and get a lower cost. Let's, let's take a look at this. And in order to do so, let's keep in mind that marginal cost, this is the change in total cost for a change in output. So let's start off by taking a look at two firms. We'll have firm one, and we'll have firm two. And together, these two firms, they make up the entire industry. Okay. We'll presume that firm one has a total cost of 100, firm two has a total cost of 150, meaning that altogether, right, altogether our industry, 100, 150, so altogether 250 is the total cost of production. Okay. We're going to presume as well that the marginal cost of each of these firms is as given. So keep in mind, marginal cost, that extra cost for that extra unit, for that incremental change, really plus or minus one. We're going to presume that this is 10 and 12. That is, we're going to say they're not productively efficient. They have different marginal costs. And we'll see why this is a problem. We don't need to add these up. We just have 10 and 12. What we're then going to do is we're going to kind of play a game. We're going to say that we will go, here's my quantity, and actually let's go change in quantity. And let's presume that firm one, they decide to produce plus one, firm two decides to do minus one. Okay, big thing to keep in mind here is that irrespective of what the original quantities were, we could have given numbers to them if we wanted to, but we didn't need to irrespective of what these initial quantities were, the total level of output in this market is staying the same. One firm is increasing by one, the other firm is decreasing by one. So just this incremental change. What we need to work out is, given this reallocation as to who's producing what, what is my new total cost? How much has my total cost changed by in each case? So, okay, keep in mind, marginal cost is that incremental change in total cost for an incremental change in output. So, let's take a look at firm one first. We went plus one. We have a marginal cost of 10. So, how do we get marginal cost of 10? That must have mean, meant that that was plus 10, right? Plus 10 for that total cost there. So, okay, change in total cost was 10. 100 to 110. Very similarly for firm two, I have a marginal cost of 12. And in this case here, my change in Q was minus one. So how do I get 12 for a change of Q of minus one? That must have mean my change in total cost was negative 12. Negative 12 over negative one gives me positive 12. So in that case there, what do I have? I have 150 minus 12. 138 is that new total cost. What does that give me for the industry then? Well, 110 plus 138 is going to give me, uh, sorry, 248. Meaning what we see here is that because each firm had a different marginal cost, just by reallocating, just by playing this plus one, minus one game, we have been able to get a cheaper, a cheaper total cost of production within the industry. Able to produce the same amount of stuff, but in a cheaper fashion. So 
clearly, ideally what we would want in order to make the best use of our scarce resources is we would want this productive efficiency to hold such that we are producing in such a way that we are producing this at the absolute least cost across all firms. Let's, let's check this. Let's make sure that this is true when my statement of productive efficiency holds. So let's update this example. And to update this example, we could leave the total cost. We could have these firms with different total costs. They just need to have the same marginal cost. So if that was the case, if that was the case, firm two, also with 10, we could work that out and we could say, okay, we've already worked out firm one, nothing's changed with that. So we know, hey, if they went plus one, that went up to 110. This firm here goes minus one. So, okay, I have a marginal cost of 10. So marginal cost equals change in total over change in Q. Change in Q is negative one. Change in Q of negative one, what's my change in total cost? That must be negative 10. So that's going to be 140. In this case here, with my marginal cost being one and the same, I can sum these and I get once again 250. Hey, I cannot reallocate my quantities in any way in this case and get a lower total cost of production. If I can't shift my production in any way to lower my total cost, I must have been productively efficient to start. So marginal costs equated, we are productively efficient. Okay, that's our idea of productive efficiency. Let's see how this works into our whole pollution abatement schemes. Let's make some room and let's take a look at that. So starting off, taking a look at our command policies. So with our command policies, let's take a look at, let's take a look at an industry. Let's take a look at the abatement. Abatement of greenhouse gases from coal. And here, this would be our quantity abated, and this would be maybe in tons of greenhouse gases, and this would be our price per greenhouse gas. And what we're going to presume is that we have two firms. We have first firm that has their marginal cost of abatement, so we'll call that marginal cost one. And we have another firm, slightly different. And they have their marginal cost of abatement, so marginal cost two. Keep in mind, right, firm two has a higher marginal cost. It costs them more to abate a unit of pollution. We can presume in this that, hey, firm two is an older power plant, right? So older power plant, it doesn't maybe burn the coal as efficiently, so that we just have this higher cost. Firm one. Firm one will presume is a newer power plant. And thus, just by default, from the fact that it's newer, it can burn the coal at higher, more efficient temperatures, and thus it's cheaper for them to implement new ways to reduce quantities, reduce their quantities of pollution, their greenhouse gases. So, kind of a bit of an idea as to our distinction. Okay, underneath a command scheme, so that's what we're taking a look at right now. We're taking a look at this command model. Let's presume that we've been able to work out somehow that, hey, the optimal level of abatement for this industry, optimal level of abatement is, let's say, 20 tons of greenhouse gas. That is our Q star abated, right? Our optimal level of abatement. So underneath the command policy, we'd say, okay, 20 tons of the greenhouse gas, that's our optimal abatement. We have two firms. Let's just split that equally between the two of them. Let's just go something like this. And we'll say each firm has to meet 10 tons of greenhouse gas as their quantity abated, right? That's how much they must abate. So again, keeping in mind, if we go this way, that is 
abatement, if we go this way, this is pollution. So by reducing 10 tons of greenhouse gases, or by increasing our abatement to 10, we are reducing our pollution by 10, right? They go hand in hand in that sense there. Okay, let's see, let's see why this is a problem. By just enforcing this on these firms and saying, and it seems fair, right? It seems to say, hey, both of you firms, you both need to figure this out. Right across the board, we need the industry to abate by 20 tons. So pay 10 tons each. There you go. Well, it seems fair, but it's not efficient. And let's see why. There we go. That is right at 10 tons. Let's make that a straight line. Oh, I'm having a hard time with that. There we go. That guy there, that's my marginal cost of firm one. Very similarly, at 10 tons, firm two, they're a dirtier firm. They cannot abate as cheaply. I'm going to have my marginal cost of firm two. What we see in this case here is that marginal cost of two does not equal, oh, does not equal the marginal cost of one. Therefore, I am not productively efficient. That is, I could technically reallocate how much abatement each firm is doing and get the same level of total abatement, still get 20 tons of greenhouse gases abated altogether, but in a cheaper way, in a significantly cheaper way. So in that case there, by just dictating to the industry, hey, here you go, you have to abate 20 tons, 10 tons each, this is going to be not the cheapest way to do it. It's not going to be a productively efficient way to do it. It's just going to result in a higher cost to society to implement. So not ideal. Above and beyond this, you would also need controls put into place. You would also need to check in. You need to make sure they are abating. So you have to have inspectors come through and actually check to say, okay, are you meeting your targets that you have? All of this is extra cost that now society has to bear as well. So all that to say, these command policies, they're not ideal. They're not efficient. Unfortunately, they are what is gravitated to by many politicians, by many climate scientists. Unfortunately, they're just not an efficient outcome. I should make a caveat to that, though. They can be. The only case where these can work and these can be an efficient outcome is in a scenario where the optimal level of abatement is 100%, or that is where optimal pollution is zero. That is, if we want to completely get rid of this, this can be an optimal way. If it's just like, yeah, you know what? The cost of this is just so great to society that it doesn't even make any sense to allow it to continue. Well, then, yes. Yes, that would be an optimal level of abatement if, if it's zero, right? And that would be an extreme case. Very, very few cases, that's the case. Asbestos might be one of those where we've said, you know what? The cost of asbestos, the health cost, the ramifications of all that are too much. We're just going to set quantity of asbestos and thus the quantity of pollution from that to zero. And command policy boom, no one's allowed to produce any asbestos. No one's allowed to have any pollution from asbestos. Very rare case. Well, let's take a look at next at our carbon tax and let's take a look at how that works out. Okay, so to take a look at a carbon tax, let's continue on with this same scenario. Let's just clean it up a little bit and restart as we take, as we work through it. So let's, let's clean up our diagram. Okay, so underneath a carbon tax, underneath a carbon tax is a scenario where we can't, or at least we don't really have good information as to what our optimal quantity abated is. That is, we just, we don't know this value. This is unknown. We can't work it out due to the model. That's, that's our problem here. Quantity abated, too difficult to work out. But what we do have a good idea of is we do have a pretty good idea on what that marginal external cost is. And by having this good idea as to what the marginal external cost is, that is the extra cost of society due to producing this stuff, well, we've said, hey, the optimal tax is equal to the marginal external cost. So what we can then do is we can begin to tax 
the production of this based off of how much pollution is attached to the production. And so with the carbon tax, what we do is we say, okay, great. Hey, coal producers, we don't care how much you pollute. You can pollute however much you want, but for every unit you pollute, you have to pay a tax. You have to pay for that pollution, right? You have to pay for that pollution. It's not free. You don't just get to pollute into our environment at no cost. And so what we would put in is we would put in a carbon tax as such. And the interesting thing is, is that by putting in this carbon tax, well, the firms, let's go take a look at firm two to start off the yellow line. The firm now needs to rationalize between what's cheaper. Is it cheaper to reduce my pollution or is it cheaper to pay the tax? And what we witness is initially for firm two, at least, initially for firm two, as we're along this part of our curve, the part where I'm shading in right now, this guy here is below my carbon tax. That is, it is actually cheaper for firm two to abate their pollution, reduce their pollution up till that point there. So I'll call that quantity abated firm two. And then once we get beyond that point, right, beyond that point, it becomes cheaper to pay the carbon tax, to pay for the right to pollute, than it is to reduce their pollution. Firm two, firm two, same kind of idea. They're looking at it and they're saying, okay, it is cheaper for us to reduce our pollution all the way till we get to this point here. And so from firm two's perspective, they are going to abate, quantity abated, sorry, from firm one's perspective, the red firm, they are going to abate all the way up to quantity abated firm one. And in this case here, what we witness is that the firm that is able to, that has the cheaper ability to abate pollution will abate more. The firm that is not as able to will abate less and just pay the tax for the right to pollute. And what we would end up at is a total level of abatement such that this might be something like this firm abates 15 units, firm two abates five units, such that, hey, what do we have all together for total abatement? All together, we would have 20 units abated. That is what our optimal amount is. If we started off knowing what this external cost is, knowing what the cost of pollution was, we could tax it accordingly and we would wind up at an optimal abatement. So if you know the optimal price, you know the optimal cost, that external cost of society, that marginal external cost of society, sorry, you could throw that in and you could wind up at an optimal level of abatement. And yes, it would be optimal. This here actually has several other benefits attached to it as well. And this is chiefly firms don't like to pay taxes. No one likes to pay taxes. So this here actually also throws in kind of an incentive for new technologies, right? This encourages an incentive for these coal firms to realize, hey, I don't need to pay this tax if I can produce electricity without greenhouse gases because I'm just paying for every greenhouse gas I emit. So if I can do some kind of technology to capture all that carbon, if I can do something that makes it so that I pollute significantly less, I don't have to pay the tax. And as a result, this encourages research and development into new green technologies such that this is cheaper than paying the carbon tax. And so by putting this in, we're also encouraging investment in new green tech. And that investment in new green tech eliminates our need for pollution, eliminates these additional costs to society. So our extra benefit from having a carbon tax. Other benefits as well, we don't need to go around and check these firms, right? We don't need to have inspectors go by and say, hey, are you meeting your targets? Because there aren't any targets. The firms are just entirely themselves self-policing, saying, okay, wow, if I have to pay this much for every ton of greenhouse gas I release, I'm going to willfully reduce my greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm going to willfully reduce them to the level of abatement such that it makes sense for me as a profit maximizing firm. 
And so essentially we're using that firm's profit maximizing against them in order to get them to internalize that cost of the tax. They cost, sorry, not internalize the cost of the tax, internalize the cost of the pollution. And we're using that tax in order to get them to internalize it. So that's the idea of our carbon tax. Place that tax in, and then we wind out with our optimal quantity abated. Last one then, let's take a look at the cap and trade model. Let's again clean up this diagram and then go take a look at that. Okay, underneath the cap and trade scenario, cap and trade, underneath this scenario, we actually know what our optimal quantity abated is. So in this case here, we have information on optimal quantity abated, but what we don't have is information on what the external, that marginal external cost to society is. We don't know what the cost of pollution is, but yet we have some way, somehow been able to work out optimal abatement. In this case, what we do is we just put in a cap on this level of abatement, just like we did on our command side. And you're like, wait, what? But command was inefficient. Yeah, 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 it was, right? And that's the problem with it. But we're going to start off with the same kind of scenario. We're going to say, okay, we want optimal abatement of 20 tons of greenhouse gases. So we're going to put, essentially, we're going to create permits to pollute. And that is, you need to have this license, you need to have this permit to pollute, and we're going to give out, let's say, if all together, let's say all together, we're going to allow 20 tons of greenhouse gas to be abated. Let's presume that something like from here all the way out to, let's say that was 100% quantity abated. Let's say that this industry released 100 tons of greenhouse gas, right? This was their pollution. And we want them to abate 20. So we want to get to something like that such that there's 80 tons after this policy so we're going to release 80 per 80 80 permits let's say each permit is for a ton of greenhouse gases that you're allowed to pollute and then these 80 permits means that okay oh uh, we have to come up with this difference we have to abate 20 tons of greenhouse gases again we have these two firms in the industry so these 20 units that need to be abated between the two firms leave us there. Sorry, not at 20. We have the two firms. So that's going to be 10 per firm such that each firm is looking at, okay, I could still release 50 tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Okay. If each firm can still release 50 tons into the atmosphere, well, they're taking a look at this and they're saying, okay, Here's my marginal cost. Firm two is saying, yep, there's my marginal cost. There's marginal cost two, marginal cost one. We see that the marginal costs are not equated. We are not productively efficient, but we're only halfway through the story. All we've done so far is the cap, right? And the cap is like our command policy where we've dictated how much pollution is allowed, and how much abatement must be done. And we've given each firm essentially the right to pollute 40 tons, that is, they have, must each abate 10 tons. Now, now comes the trade. These firms are allowed to trade their pollution permits or buy and sell these pollution permits to each other. And that is, if we take a look at firm two, Firm two is taking a look at this, and let's just give it a number, right? Let's just make up a number here. Let's say this is $15 a permit, where firm one has something like, sorry, not dollars per permit, 10. So in this case here, actually, let's go, let's go one lower. Let's go nine. There we go. This here would be the extra cost to reduce that last unit of pollution. So, okay, firm one cost them $9 to reduce their 10th unit of pollution. Firm two, it cost them $15 to reduce their last unit of pollution. Here we have room for gains from trade, right? We can say, hey, hey, we could go firm one. Firm one could abate more pollution. Let's use the right tool there. Firm one could abate more pollution and give that permit or sell that permit 
to firm two, right? And that way there, it only cost firm one maybe, I don't know, let's say it cost firm one $10 to go and abate their 11th unit. But by selling that permit, firm two, firm two would have had a cost of 14. That is, firm two would have had a willingness to pay of $14 to be able to pollute, to not abate, where firm one had a willingness to pay, sorry, not a willingness to pay, my goodness. Firm one had a willingness to accept of $10. Room for trade, right? We could sell an abatement permit. Firm one could abate more. Firm two could abate less. And we could sell these permits back and forth until we wind up at an equilibrium price of permits. Such that at this equilibrium price of permits, what do we have? We would have price of a permit. And then at each price of a permit, we would have. Firm two, how much they would abate, and thus alternatively how much they would pollute. Firm one, how much they would abate, and thus how much they would pollute. So firm one used to be 10. They're buying pollution permits because it's cheaper to buy the pollution permits than it is to pollute. Sorry, cheaper to buy the pollution permits than it is to abate. And in the end, they end up abating five units at the price of the permit. And again, I'm just making that up just to make things work. Similarly, firm one, they're selling pollution permits. They're saying, hey, for us, it's cheaper to abate than it is for us to have the permit. We can actually make money by selling you permits and just reducing pollution ourselves. So firm one is abating more and more and more and more pollution until we wind up here. And altogether, they end up abating 15 units. In this case here, by setting the initial capped amount at 10 units per firm, 20 altogether, then allowing the firms to trade between themselves, we get a new market being formed for pollution permits. And then this market for pollution permits, each firm then equates cost of pollution to their cost of abatement. And we get our level of abatement, which is still working out to that optimal level. And again, now we are efficient. Now this is a productively efficient solution because hey, at price permit, right there, I have my marginal cost one, and at the same line, I have my marginal cost two. So marginal costs are equated by each firm, and thus I am now productively efficient. So distinction between the carbon tax and cap and trade, in our carbon tax scenario, we know the price, we don't know the quantity. So we set the cost of pollution, the firms figure out how much to pollute, how much to abate. Under the cap and trade model, we know that optimal level of pollution, we know that optimal level of abatement. So in that scenario there, because we know the optimal pollution, we know the abatement, we set that. Once we have that set, we work backwards, and through the price of the permits, we arrive at a price of pollution. Both scenarios would give us the same result, it's just attacking it from a different direction. Price to quantity, or quantity to price. Otherwise, identical, identical outcome there. Okay, well, let's take a look at a situation, let's work through this all the way from start to finish, and see how this all works out. And we'll take a look at this mathematically. So let's take a look at that. Let's say, going right back, we're going to be taking a look at our market for pulp. And we're going to presume that our market for pulp is represented as follows. We have a price, we have a quantity, and we'll say that price is 850 minus 2q and price is 50 plus 2q 
Keep in mind here, this guy here, 850 minus 2Q, that guy there is my marginal social benefit. This one here, 50 plus 2Q, upward sloping positive slope, that's my marginal social cost. I guess, no, not my marginal social cost, marginal private cost. Right? That is the firm's cost of producing. So if we take a look at this, let's do that guy first. That guy is my supply, my marginal private cost. 50 is my intercept there. Marginal social benefit starting at 850, dropping down. 850, that is my marginal social benefit, which is one and the same as my marginal private benefit. What we'll do in this scenario is I'll say that the initial equilibrium for pulp is, what do we have, 200 units? With an initial quantity exchange, sorry, initial quantity exchange was 200 units with an initial price of 450. As represented, we have the price, let's say this is per ton of pulp. We have a ton of pulp being worth $450, and altogether we are producing. We have a quantity exchange of 200 tons altogether. Let's presume that we also know that at current production, we are releasing 4,000 tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and we estimate that all of this, this production, this pollution, all of that has an estimated external cost of $2,000. External cost. Okay, what we want to figure out in a few different ways is we want to figure out, first of all, a bunch of questions here. What is our marginal external cost? We also want to know how could we correct this problem? How could we correct this problem? Or is there even a problem to correct, right? That'd probably be a better way to do it. From here, we want to know then what is, if we correct this problem, what is our socially optimal production? And then attached to that, I'd also say, hey, what is our social optimal pollution? Right? What is our socially optimal level of pollution? Then what we want to say is, okay, as we go through this, how would we use a command policy to do it? How would we use a emissions tax, a carbons tax? And then what would we do if we had cap and trade? Right? Let's work through it in each of those three different scenarios. And in order to do that, right, we'll just kind of do that same kind of simplifying assumption that we have two firms. And we'll take a look at this through our command, through a carbon tax and through cap and trade. So kind of our layout as to what we're going to explore, what we're going to work through as we work through this problem here. And then we'll talk about, okay, out of these policies, which ones would you recommend? And we'll say, do they increase or decrease social welfare as we go through it? So let's start off. Let's take a look at this. First thing I want to do is I want to say, okay, great. There's my pollution. I'm going to go, I'm going to augment this axis, and I'm going to say, here we go, quantity in terms of tons of greenhouse gases, just so I can keep this in mind. And I'm saying at current production, I have 4,000. So, okay. 4,000, that is, I want to kind of have an idea, how much greenhouse gases do I release per ton of pulp? So I want to know ton of greenhouse gases per ton of pulp. So that is going to be greenhouse gas per pulp. So 4,000 all over 200. Cancel those out. 40 divided by 2 is 20 tons of greenhouse gas per ton of pulp produced. Okay, that's just a bit of an FYI so that I know. I also know that, okay, altogether my external cost is 2000 That's my total external cost. I need to find out my marginal external cost. 
And keep in mind the context as we're talking about. This externality diagram is the externality diagram for the market for pulp. So that is my marginal external cost is going to be, hey, how much extra cost do I have? Uh, extra cost, that's in terms of dollars per extra ton of pulp. So I'm looking for those kind of units. How much extra cost for an extra ton of pulp? Well, if I'm producing 2,000, sorry, if I'm producing 200 tons of pulp and I have an external cost of $200, well, that would be $2,000 all over 200 tons of pulp. 20 over 2 gives me 10 per ton of pulp. So I get my marginal external cost in that case there. Knowing my marginal external cost, well, I can then go and throw in my marginal social cost. And I can do that because my marginal social cost, that is just my marginal private plus that marginal external, where I know that that marginal external cost, marginal external cost is 10 per ton of pulp. Okay, so hey, if that's 10 vertical distance between the lines everywhere, that means my marginal social cost curve has an intercept right there of 60. Again, 10 being that vertical distance between the two. Okay, what I also want to do, and again, just so that I have this for reference later, I know now what my cost is per ton of pulp. Every time I produce a ton of pulp, I have an extra social cost of $10. But we're ultimately going to be modeling things in terms of pollution, not in terms of production, right? Pulp is good. It's an economic good. We get benefit from it. We don't from pollution. So I want to know what is actually my cost per ton of greenhouse gas. I know what the external cost is for a ton of pulp, but what's that external cost per ton of greenhouse gas? So I'd want to kind of do the same idea, right? I want to go dollars per ton of greenhouse gas. So I have an external cost of 2,000. So external cost of 2,000, and I'm producing 4,000 tons of greenhouse gas. 4,000 tons of greenhouse gas. That's going to give me 0 0.5 per ton of greenhouse gas. So okay, I have my in this case here my cost of pollution. I figure based off of this that a ton of greenhouse gas is worth 50 cents, right? That's the cost of society. Every ton thrown up into the atmosphere creates about 50 cents of trouble for society. Just in case you're interested, some recent research by Environment Canada actually puts that closer to $300 per ton of greenhouse gas. So significantly more. Uh, current carbon tax here in BC is about $30 per ton of greenhouse gas. So significantly more than what we're imagining here, significantly less than what Environment Canada puts it at. So just something that we can kind of work out through this and consider. Let's just move that up here for now. Okay, we have that. How could we correct this problem? Well, we've seen that the way we can correct this problem is ultimately through either a command policy, a carbon tax, or a cap and trade. But in order to do that, we would need to know really what the outcome is. And that outcome, well, okay, we'd be good to go ahead with our carbon tax because we know what our marginal external cost is. And ideally, we'd want to set this tax equal to that external cost of pollution. So we could move ahead with that. Command, cap and trade, we couldn't go ahead with that yet. Because to go ahead with that, I would need to know what my optimal abatement is. And I don't know what that optimal abatement is. I deleted this line somehow. I don't know what that optimal abatement is yet. Oh, that's what I did. I moved it up here by accident. There we go. I don't know what that optimal abatement is yet. In order to find that optimal abatement, what I would have to do first is find my socially optimal level of production and then recognize that, hey, as I carry that socially optimal level of production down, I would get my optimal level of pollution. And then the difference between these two would be my optimal level of abatement. So let's work out what that quantity social is. What this guy right here, 
optimal level of pulp production given this social cost. And in order to figure this out, what am I going to do? I need to set marginal social cost equal to the marginal social benefit. So marginal social cost curve, that was 60 plus 2Q, right? Just my private cost plus that external cost of 10. So that gives me my 60. Gives me my marginal social benefit curve of 850 minus 2Q. 850 minus 2q. So let's go through our algebraic voodoo. Let's move this negative 2 over to the other side. We'll get 60 plus 4q equals 850. Get that 4q by itself. So subtract 650 from both sides and I get 4q equals 790. Divide both sides by 4. We get 790 divided by 4 is 197.5. So we get a social, a social optimal level of pulp production of 197.5. So just slightly reducing how many tons of pulp we produce. What we need to figure out then is attached to that. What is our optimal pollution? What is that optimal level of pollution? Well, okay, in order to figure this out, this is where kind of our calculations earlier come in handy to us. We can say, hey, hey, we have 20 tons of greenhouse gas per ton of pulp. So in that case there, if I go 197.5 times 20, I get my current pollution of 39.50. That is attached to the optimal production is the optimal pollution. And in this case here, what have I done? I have abated, right? My optimal abatement would be 50 units, 50 tons of greenhouse gas. So we get that result there. And we get our optimal abatement. Hey, great. Now we have optimal abatement. We can work out command. We can work out cap and trade. So... We're good with this externality model for now. Well, let's start off with the carbon tax because that's the one we had information for first. And let's see how this works through in our case. And really, this is the one where we did a lot of our solving for. We're going to be doing a lot of smoke and mirrors, a lot of waving our hands to solve through this guy down at the bottom. And let's take a look at that. So carbon tax. Underneath the carbon tax, we are going to, let's actually make straight lines. We're going to presume again, oh, we are going to presume again that we have two firms and we're dealing with quantity abated and price of abatement. These two firms again are going to be firm and firm and that will be the marginal cost of firm one and the marginal cost of firm two such that again, right, one firm is cleaner, able to abate more cheaply than the other. In this case here, we're gonna put in our carbon tax. Well, let's get a straight line, sorry. We're gonna put our, our carbon tax somewhere around there. I'm just picking a point. There is our carbon tax. And ideally, we'd wanna put in, okay, what's the value of this carbon tax? And often what I end up seeing happening here is saying, hey, there is our $10 per ton of pulp. The way we correct this externality is we put in a tax and we get our supply plus our tax line. That's our marginal private cost plus tax. Hey, tax was equal to marginal external cost. So $10 per ton of pulp. And then you go through and you say, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we can do that. That's our tax price. That's the price producers receive. And we're just in back in our tax scenario. We're great. And so you say, okay, what's our carbon tax? Our carbon tax is $10 per ton of pulp. And here's the thing. I wouldn't necessarily fault you for that. I'd say, yeah, okay, you're right. We are actually paying $10 per ton of pulp. But keep in mind what we're actually dealing with here. 
our quantity abated is in terms of tons of greenhouse gas. So we're not actually setting our tax in terms of our production. We're setting our tax in terms of pollution, right? We don't want to tax them for producing pulp. We want to tax them for polluting greenhouse gases. So technically, although not wrong, our true greenhouse gas would be in terms of, in terms of, we said, hey, $10 per ton of pulp or 50 cents per ton of greenhouse gas, right? That was the external cost, that marginal external cost for greenhouse gases. So in that case there, ideally we'd set this at 50 cents per ton of greenhouse gas. As we set that at 50 cents per ton of greenhouse gas, and we're not gonna get into the math as to where these lines come from, we're just gonna wave our hands and say, okay, boom, there's my marginal cost, there's my quantity abated for firm two. Same idea, boom, there it is for firm one. And then based off of that, we set the tax at the optimal tax that is at the marginal external cost. The firms will then align their abatement based off of their ability and we'll get our quantity abated. Keep in mind, we said that Q star abatement was 50 tons of greenhouse gas. So that is, we would expect if we work through this, something like 40 and 10, right? Such that all together, we are abating in this industry 50 tons of greenhouse gas. So would work through in that kind of way, right? And we're just waving our hands. That could have been 30 and 20. It could have been 25 and 25 if they both had the same marginal cost curves. I'm just kind of demonstrating that, hey, two firms, we set the tax in. They abate based off of their ability, based off of right, their way and their cost, their benefits. Do I abate? Do I pay to pollute? What do I do? And we wind up with our optimal quantity abated right at Q star abatement. That is, these two guys together is 50, which goes right back to that. Great. Awesome. That's the result we wanted. Okay. What about our other scenario? Well, in our other scenario, let's take a look at this cap and trade. So in cap and trade, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with knowing that we want to abate 50 tons of greenhouse gas. So same kind of assumptions. Same kind of assumptions. We have these two firms. We have these two firms, and that's going to give us price and quantity abated. We're going to have the red one. We're going to have the yellow one. And what did I do? I think I said marginal cost one and marginal cost two. In this scenario, we want to go, we want to say, yes, we are abating altogether 20, well, 50 units of greenhouse gas. And so that works out to be 25 per firm. 25 per firm, that gives us our initial marginal cost for firm one. I guess firm red, the two and our initial marginal cost for firm one, the yellow firm. So marginal cost one, marginal cost two. We see at this point here that, hey, marginal cost one does not equal marginal cost two. So therefore at this point we are productively inefficient, right? We are not producing in a least cost kind of way in this industry, but all we've done is cap so far. What will happen is these two firms will trade. Firm two that can abate cheaply will sell permits at a high price. Firm one, who has the more expensive cost of abatement, will buy firms rather than abate. And what we'll wind up with is we will wind up with a price of permits such that under this price of permits, we will have once again quantity abated by firm two, quantity abated by firm one. And again, this would work out to be exactly like we had it in our last case. And that means that as we went through this, 
If we end up at optimal abatement of 50 units, this price in which the permits must be trading at must be 50 cents per ton of greenhouse gas or $10 per ton of pulp. That must be the equivalent price of a permit that these two firms end up settling on in order to get this optimal level of abatement. And why, why must that be the case? Because if we go back to our externality and think about our market for pulp, if we are successfully negotiated from moving from 200 down to 197.5, that is from 4,000 down to 39.50, the only way that that could be true is if we had to pay extra for our production and that amount of extra that we had to pay for our production was the cost of a permit, which would have been this $10 shifting our supply. So in that case there, cap and trade, starting off with our optimal abatement, ending up with the optimal price of pollution. Carbon tax, starting off with the optimal price of pollution, ending up with optimal abatement. Two different flip sides of the same coin. Okay, long-winded, really big example to show how that all works through. Am I gonna have you work through all that yourself? No, this is an introductory course. This is just really to see the idea as to how cap and trade works, how carbon taxes work, why they are efficient, why they are the policies that really we need to combat climate change. Big bits with this is, okay, recognizing where they fit, being able to work through this and saying, hey, optimal carbon tax would be equal to the marginal external cost. Hey, optimal cap and trade amount would be a quantity abated of 50. Being able to pull those amounts out, yes, you need to do that. Flowing through to these, no, no, that's just a lot of extra steps. So that's the basis of environmental economics. That's what we're introducing, at least for now. If you have any questions on working through this, feel free to reach out to me, D2L, Frequently Asked Questions, or by email. In the next video, what we're going to be taking a look at is a little bit outdated now because everything is advancing so fast, but kind of our current state of affairs given climate change. So let's take a look at that next.